Right, welcome, guys. Uh, just wait a little bit while we get a few more filing in. It's bang on one o'clock, so um, we'll just give it a few minutes. Um, pop where you're from or, or how your day has been in the chat, if you like, guys, as well. Get it cracking. Um, we've got Travis here from Fitness Education Online. I'm sure a few of you have um, met him previously and, and been on sessions like this previously as well with Travis. Um, I'm sure many of you have done other courses with Fitness Education Online as well. So today he's going to be taking you through uh, a little bit of functional training um, and a bit about that as well. So um, as always, guys, you'll be getting a CC for today. Um, so that'll be added to your uh, accounts automatically. So no need to um, get a certificate or anything like that. And um, the survey should pop up for you after. So if you have any questions around that, um, just get in touch with myself um, or Oz Active and we can we can sort you out. Um, but Travis, take it away. Whenever you want. Yeah. G'day. That's funnily enough, one of the one of the biggest emails I get after these sessions, the people asking me, how do I get my CECs? And yeah. uh, yes, it's good that you say that because I'm always like, well, I don't know, you have to take it up with Oz Active. It's, it's, yeah, I'm yeah. not the one who's handing out the CECs on this one. So yeah, exactly. um, fine. welcome everybody um, from all around Australia, as I can see here. Thank you for, for being here. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with me um, and, and my business and or, you know, fitness education online. If you are, hello and welcome. If not, um, you know, you're hopefully going to enjoy today's presentation. Um, let me just get my screen share up and just make sure the sound is on. Perfect. So as we're going through today, uh, I'll do my best to get into the chat and, and prompt you guys to, to have a bit of a chat with me as well. Uh, if you do have like a specific question, the best thing to do is to throw it in the Q&A. So if you've got a specific question that you want to ask, throw it in the Q&A because that way it won't get lost in, in the chat stream that, that floats around. So uh, the chat stream goes pretty quickly with so many people in here. Um, so yeah, so if you've got a proper question, throw it in the Q&A. Uh, if I'm just asking general questions, in the chat is perfect. Uh, welcome, welcome everybody. A couple of familiar names in here. I believe, yes, I believe you do get access to it afterwards, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but I, I do believe you get access to it uh, after the recording. Um, so functional training. So today, uh, well, before we dive into the presentation, I'll tell you a little bit about who we are, who I am. Uh, we've been around since 2014, Fitness Education Online. Um, we've got probably over 30 courses now. Um, I've got to change this. I've done this prior to the uh, old habits there with Oz Active. Uh, about 30 courses now with Oz Active, uh, founded by Jono Petrohoulos. A lot of you guys would know Jono. Um, he's out there on social media a lot and a pretty um, gets his face out there plenty of uh, plenty of times. Uh, he's got a Bachelor of Physiology. Uh, he's been in the industry fitness industry for at least 10 years. We're probably both pushing about 15 years in the industry. And myself, uh, I come from an education background and again, also been in the industry for a similar time as Jono. Uh, we're probably both pushing more towards 15 years there. So basically who we are, like I said, we're, we're predominantly an education company focusing on CECs, uh, but we've got another a whole uh, range of other stuff that we do now. So we do do certificate three and four in fitness, and we do also have a software product for personal trainers, kind of like a, a MailChimp or Active Campaign and ClickFunnels thing all rolled into one. Um, so we've also got a very large Facebook group, uh, definitely the largest in Australia and one of the largest globally as well. That's the Fitness Education Online Community Group. Um, you know, throw it in there if you're if you're in the chat. If you're in that group, throw it in the chat. Say, yeah, we're in the group. If you're not, um, please have a look and join the group. It's at about 15,500 members. Um, you'll get these notes as well, and you can click on the links in the notes for some of this stuff as well. Uh, anyone in our group will also get an access, access to our free fitness games. Um, which ties in quite well to what we do. Uh, we've also got a podcast, um, the Fitness Education Online podcast. A lot of it is around business tips, um, sharing a whole heap of different information. And there's also a little series in there called Bro Science, which I do with my brother. Um, and he's a sports medicine GP. And so that's breaking down some of the science and some of the more practical elements of fitness, uh, which we're actually going to chat about in today's presentation as well. A bunch of this stuff has come thanks to his research. Well, not his research. He's, it's not his research, but he's, he's presented it to me. So through today's presentation, what we are, oh, just going back here, um, 
in in the group and we've got a bunch of people in the group yeah i'm in the group yeah perfect um and if you've listened to the podcast let us know if you've listened to the podcast and if you enjoy enjoy it hopefully uh hopefully it gives you good value as well there all right so what we're going to be going over in today's presentation uh, is functional training we're going to be talking about a little bit why it's so popular um look all of this is pretty subjective to my personal opinion as well. Um, so it'd be great to, in the chat, maybe hear from yourself as well, what your thoughts are on the topic, um, what it is, okay, why it's so popular, what it is, why it's so important, plus some science around it, um, some information about adding it into your programs and what it might look like in your programs, and then some equipment that works well for functional training. There's a hint uh, in this slide right now, the stuff that I think works really well for functional training. So why functional training and what is it? So we'll just go back here from all over. Yeah, perfect. Just having a look at quickly at the chat. All right, perfect. So why functional training? So those of you uh, who follow the a ACSM um, guide or the ACSM Global Fitness Trends, uh, for 2022, uh, in Australia at least, it was listed as the number one fitness trend in Australia. Now it has slid in a couple of the other countries over the last few years, but it was listed as the number one trend here in Australia. So the question is why? So I'd love to, if you're in the chat quickly, why why do you think functional training or why are you here today? Like why is functional training a big trending topic in your opinion in the chat? Uh, I'd love to see if you can typely, quickly type that in the chat if uh, if you get the chance, um, because I think it's, uh, it's a topic that's, that's a, as I said, a very hot topic, functional medicine. Yep. Yep, real life fitness applies to everyday life. Perfect. These are the, yeah, perfect. Yeah, Rebecca, I like that one. Love it. Love it. Functional context. Yep, perfect. Yeah, so hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys, uh, looks like a lot of you resonate with what is going to be my opinion here. So, my thoughts is it's a versatile term. It's a broad term that fits into a lot of different demographics or a lot of fits into for a lot of different demographics. And it also fits in a lot of different training modalities. So what's functional for, you know, like a 15 year old, 25 year old, 50 year old, 80 year old is all different. Um, and it's all different stuff. Um, and then also like the actual training effort and modalities are also different between those people. All right. So it's a very broad term. So if we break down the list, so this is of the top 20. So these are the top 20. And these are things on the list that I think really fit well within a functional training inverted commas sort of um, branch. Strength training with free weights, second on the list. I think if I, if I asked you what sort of stuff would you use with functional training, a lot of you would say free weights, uh, body weight, stuff like that. So that's second on the list. Program Fitness programs for older adults. A lot of you here would say functional is about real life activities, everyday activities. That's third on the list. Group training. A lot of functional training sits in a group realm. Um, you know, think you know, F45, all those sort of things. A lot of people would call that functional training. Fourth on the list. Whoa, I'm going to be quick there. Body weight training I spoke about as well. Sixth on the list. Small group training, pretty similar to um, group exercise there as well. Tenth on the list. So I think within those uh, five categories, all of those pretty much fit um within functional training would everyone agree with that give us a little thumbs up or a yes or yeah whatever you yep so that's within the top 20 right but it's also adding into the list so these are some of the things that you guys have also said here i can see in the chat personal training definitely a lot of people within personal training would call it functional training uh it fits within hit as well i would say which is eighth uh, inclusive fitness services. I think it definitely fits in there as well. Um, exercise is medicine. I think it definitely fits in the exercise is medicine category. Uh, core training. I think whenever someone talks about functional training, a lot of it goes around, you're using your core, you're activating your core, all that sort of stuff. That's 14th on the list. And then someone also spoke about sort of rehab style or prehab style exercise. And that is also on the list of the top 20. So of the top 20 um, global fitness trends, at least within Australia um, for 2022, it's a bit different country to country, but these were the ones within Australia. I think you could say functional training fits within, I think that's uh, 11 of them. Is that five, 
six. I think you could say functional training or all of these, 11 of these, they could all fit within the branch of functional training. Uh, are we in agreement on that? You can throw a thumbs up. You can throw a, a high five, a smiley face, a yes. So it looks like we're pretty much all on the same page. Um, you know, if you if you disagree with it, you know, that's cool as well. But like I said, this is all within my my personal opinion of the topic. Yeah, great. So lots of love there. So perfect. Thank you very much. Glad I'm not the only crazy person out there. So to me, functional training really fits in to all of those above topics quite comfortably. Um, and like I said, that's more than 50% of the top 20 list. So uh, that's why I think the term functional training is so popular because it means so many different things to so many different people. So I'm going to have a little bit of fun through uh, today's presentation. Hopefully you can hear this uh, video about to come up. Um, so if it fits into so many different categories, what is it? If you're not functional training and you're still using machines and bodybuilding exercises, welcome to irrelevancy. I mean, do you even know how to hold proper knee alignment while twisting your upper body with good core activation? So I don't know if you guys are familiar with JP Sears. He's gone a bit political nowadays. Hopefully you heard that. Uh, but I think one of the best videos he ever did was a, was a video he did around functional training because I find it pretty hilarious. Um, but he said a bunch of good stuff in that video. You all heard that, I assume. Um, in that video, jokes aside, he points to why this is so versatile. He talks about free weights, not machines or bodybuilding. Yeah, I think everyone would agree with that as a general sentiment. Knee alignment to me just refers to movement mechanics. All right, just making sure you're moving in a functional way as opposed to a dysfunctional way, right? I think that's a fair statement. He's making jokes, right? And, and we've got a few other videos from that from that particular video. If you've seen it, it it's it's a good one. Um, twisting the upper body, you know, like it's some some of these things that you see in functional fitness, which I'll show you in another video later. But twisting the upper, upper body to me refers to working in different planes of motion. So you're just not in that sagittal plane. You're transverse. You're, you're also um, in the frontal plane as well. Core activation, like I said, it's a really big one in that functional space. You know, but if we go a little bit deeper into each of these as well. So it's different to all individuals. So let's see how JP Sears uses functional training for himself. I use functional training to help me better live my non-functional lifestyle. I use box jumps because they help me climb the one step that I need to traverse in order to get into work each day. Battle ropes train my body to have the capacity to shake people's hands. Kettlebell swings improve my performance of throwing things into the garbage. Planks prepare my body to lean forward onto my desk without collapsing. So, so again, it's a bit of a you know, satirical take on it, but there's a lot of truth in some of these elements. Yeah, some laughing faces there. Like, a, uh, it, as I said, this full video is my favorite video and I'm gonna, I've got a couple of other clips from it as well. But I ask you, a bicep curl, is this functional or not? So you can either write yes or no in the chats. Um, yes or no, yep, yep, sure, why not, yep. Perfect. Okay, good. All right. There's more yeses than I was expecting. I wasn't expecting so many yeses for this. Uh, and there's a we in there. We. Yeah, okay. Not sure. 50-50. Well, a lot of you probably would say I was expecting more no's. But to me, what if you're someone who had limited use of an arm and it's about relearning of habit, relearning an activity? And for you, it could be about feeding or drinking. So a bicep curl in that case could become a very functional activity for that individual. You know, like I've been unlucky enough where I injured my neck at jujitsu about five years ago now. Luckily, I've had no real long-term damage, but I had nerve damage and I sort of lost use of my arm, like proper 100% use of my arm for probably about six months. It was about an 18-month recovery, um, all atrophied, all through my shoulder, my, my rear delts, all that sort of stuff. Uh, wasted away, um, and for me, I, I couldn't I couldn't hang on a bar. I couldn't hold things with my my right hand anymore. So functional stuff for me was like really getting usage, like proper usage back of my arm, right? So functional training again. Why I think it's so important is it's a very broad term. What's functional for a twenty year old is likely to be very different for an eighty year old. And we're going to look at some of this stuff as well a little bit later. What's functional for an elite rugby player 
is going to be different to what's functional for an elite gymnast. All right. But let's have a look into like more, a, a more gen pop focus. What are their goals? Typically, uh, you know, maybe we'll throw in, what are your typical client's goals? Throw in a few goals in the chat here. Yeah. Lifting up the wine glass. Yeah, that's pretty important sometimes, right? Yeah, perfect. So general population goals, a lot of them, uh, a lot of the times will be things like losing weight, being able to move pain free, having some more energy, maybe sleeping better, uh, carrying the shopping, it could be getting the kids in and out of the car. Uh, or for me, it could be carrying around your toddler because we're on a walk, and he doesn't want to go in the pram, he doesn't want to walk, he doesn't want to go in his bike. And I'm left left trying to carry them around for 35 minutes or 40 minutes of our walk. That is functional training for a lot of people. And I'm guessing it's probably the same for a lot of your clients. So if you have a program or you're offering something that's solving some of these problems, that's functional for your clients. That's functional for them. Okay. So that is what I would say functional training is in a nutshell. Very, very broad. Um, and applicable for a lot of people in a lot of different contexts. And I think everyone's on the same page there. Um, all right. So how important is it? So how important is functional training? So I think we can all agree that most forms of exercise and movement can be seen as functional, all right? A lot of exercise, a lot of movement can be seen as functional. So I would say, therefore, it's extremely important, okay? So we're going to look at a couple of studies that I think fit inside a functional training realm, okay? First is exercise in general. How important is exercise in general? Walking speed. And, you know, we've had a few people talk about uh, walking, working with older adults, okay? Uh, so walking speed, grip strength, uh, and then getting up off the ground. So we're going to have a look at a couple of these different studies and what this can mean to someone in their functional everyday life. Uh, and then some false statistics as well. So how important is exercise in general? There's this term that's uh, gone around in some journals called smoker diabetes, right? Basically, smoking, diabetic, uh, diabetes, and obesity as a combined factor, all right? And if we're going to add in there sedentary behavior, so we've got someone who smokes, diabetes, uh, is diabetic, and uh, is overweight or obese, and then also is sedentary. So if you wanted to help this person live longer, what do you do first? What's the thing that's going to make the biggest difference to their everyday life? All right. Have a look. Yeah, so they've got movement. We've got awareness. We've got walking. We've got stop smoking, uh, exercise, any movement. There you guys, you guys are all over this. Education, give up smoking. You guys are all over this. But the thing that's actually going to make the biggest clinical difference is getting an inactive person active. That's going to make the absolute biggest difference compared to the confounding factors of smoking, diabetics or diabetes or obesity, getting them moving. All right. So this is the attributable factors of, of death, unfortunately. Right. Uh, as you can see here, low fitness male, female, compared to the three tied together, added up male and female, right? Having the biggest impact on their health is going to be getting them moving. It blew my mind as well. Like I said, a lot of these stats come from my, uh, a lot of this information has come from my brother. We did a whole podcast on this uh, as well. Um, he's a sports medicine GP and I've got the references as well uh, later on for those who care. But even compared to treating the independent factors, of like getting them stopping to smoke, getting them to treat their diabetes, having them moving makes the biggest impact in their longevity, which was outstanding, uh, like completely incredible information. Uh, there's also another study that looked at the life expectancy of the UK bus drivers compared to their ticket collectors. All right. And what it found was that the ticket collectors were on average living 15 years longer simply because they were walking up and down the stairs, they were standing, they were moving for most of their day 
as opposed to the bus driver who is just seated the whole time. All right, completely incredible information. So uh, three and a half uh, hours a week is the standard of what we're trying to get of moderate exercise, okay? With the main focus of limiting physical inactivity, all right? So you're really going to try to get people up. So a lot of you people say, a lot of you guys said walking, moving, that's exactly what we're talking about, okay? So getting people moving, yeah, walking to the bin, uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so a lot of stuff there, a lot of comments there. Perfect. Yeah, you're neat, exactly right. So the second one we're going to look at is the study around, this one was titled, How Fast Does the Grim Reaper Walk? All right, so this is talking about the walking speed of a client. So this was a study of um, 1,700 men, or just over 1,700 men. Sorry, ladies, it was only on men. Um, 70 and above, all right? It went too quick. Uh, what it found that a walking speed of 0.82 meters a second, which is about three kilometers an hour, was one of the most predictive elements of mortality, of death, okay? So if your client or your people are walking slower than three kilometers an hour, they're going to get caught by the Grim Reaper, all right? Now, no men in this study who had walking speeds of above 1.36 meters per second, which is about five kilometers an hour, were caught by death in this particular study. So anyone who could walk at a pace of five kilometers an hour had a much longer predictive, well, they weren't, they didn't die in the, in the, in the span of the study, okay? Um, so walking speed is a huge, huge one. So you guys spoke about balance, you guys spoke about some of this stuff. So having people continue being able to walk uh, at a speed of five kilometers an hour is a very vital thing to work on. All right, uh, and this was also uh, backed up by another study, like a meta-analysis as well, which uh, looked at life expectancy uh, for all ages and both sexes. So it was also backed up by another study as well. So keep away from the Grim Reaper. Right, perfect. Just having a look at the chat. Yep, perfect. Grip strength is another one. So what can your handshake tell us? So this was another study. Uh, again, men, unfortunately, women are left out of a, a lot of uh, uh, physical studies. Um, about 6,000 between the ages of 45 and 68, starting in the 60s. So of those people, as you can see, about half of them uh, didn't survive uh, when they were looked at uh, in the follow-up research 25 years later. So what it also concluded in this study that walking speed was a high confidence uh, a high confidence factor for their mortality. So if they could keep walking quickly, that was also there. The other thing is a risk of self-care disability was more than two times greater compared to the, the people who had low grip strength and those who had highest grip strength. So those who had low grip strength were living, uh, well, needed care. Well, we're living in cared facilities. Those with the highest grip strength were still living independent lives the 25 years after this particular study. So those men would be, I suppose, what's 45 plus 25, has good math, 70, or 70 up to 95, I suppose, almost, all right? Um, so again, a hand grip strength was highly predictive of functional limitations and disability 25 years later. So making sure you keep your grip strength. It's not something that we train specifically, but what trains grip strength? It's just training in general. It's lifting things. It's carrying things. It's, you know, everything you do involves your grip strength. So the, the less physically active you are, the, the more your grip strength will decline. All right. There's obviously other factors in there as well. But typically speaking, people who are physically active in the guard and in this still have better grip strength. All right. The sit and rise test is another one. Let's have a look. Yeah, yeah, Jeff's talking about R3. Yeah, obviously, that uh, there's some of those factors involved as well. Sit and rise test. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this one. This is another great one. This is the ability to get up off the ground. Uh, this was done in Brazil. Again, uh, this one had men and women uh, between the ages of 51 and 80. And what it found was the ability to get up off the ground was a predictor as how long someone was going to be able to live. So basically how it works is you're getting up and off the ground or you're going from standing to the ground and then back up again. There's a few factors here with knees and hips and all this sort of stuff as well, right? But what happens is you lose a point, all right? 
every time you like use your hands or use your knees and the more points you lose there's a predictor there of your longevity okay so if between 51 and 80 year olds so if you have a look here if we look here these are the people who survived the test over the 14 years um over the 14 year study the people who were scored between zero and three that means they put their hands down seven times standing and sitting you can see there about 40 percent of them had dropped off compared to the people who only put their hands down once or twice what's that you know that's what not above 90 so less than 10 percent of them had dropped off in the next 14 years right so as you can see getting up and off the ground is a strong predictor of how much longer you're going to live all right it's a predictor right it's not the be all and end all i wouldn't do it i wouldn't run this study with a client and say well you know what you touched around seven times so like you'll be lucky to be here in 14 years time it's, yeah it's, it's not for us to have those conversations right and same with the walking speed but what it is it is it allows us to have some of these indications about what we can work on and what we can improve in our programming of what we would call functional training all right and this is you know this one is done by age but you know we all i'm sure we've all worked with clients who are you know overweight who have that difficulty of getting up and off the ground all right so you've got to work on all of this stuff over the long term as well so we're just going to have a look at the yeah, there's heaps of other ones. So Jeff's Jeff's talking about the balance test. Yeah, there's, there's there are lots of other ones as well. Uh, these are just some of the ones that I've I've picked out uh, specifically. Uh, yep, there we go. So again, uh, twenty one percent improvement on survival based on your scores in this test. Now the other one, fall statistics globally, huge concern. You know, six hundred and fifty thousand falls are occurring occurring each year, and basically the leading cause of unintentional injury death. Okay after road accidents, so it's a huge issue. 27,000 hospitalizations uh, and 400 deaths uh, in New South Wales, and it's the highest costing thing in our healthcare system on New South Wales base, um, so that's why New South Wales statistic. Counts for 40% of all injury deaths, um, and one in three people over the age of 65, and one in two over the age of 80 are at risk of a fall that can lead to serious injury, right? This all goes beyond balance training as well. So again, I bring us back to what I was talking about with what is functional training. It looks different at every age. So a lot of these stats obviously focus on, uh, you know, a bit of an older population, but it's something that we need to account for. You don't just start when you're 80 and go, okay, well, I'm gonna start doing this stuff now. You need to start when you're 30. You need to start, you know, at a young age to have these skills as you get older. All right. So it goes beyond balance training. It goes into strength training. It goes into movement. It goes into speed. It goes into grip strength. It goes into mobility, getting up and off the ground. So as you can see, functional training is crossing over to all of these studies for a lot of different training options. All right. Uh, there are some, some, some uh, extra things there. So strength, gait imbalances, and speed, uh, all of those sort of things are factored in to these studies around what I would consider important for functional training, right? Everyone follow me with those studies, everyone sort of in, in pretty good agreement. Yeah, that's another one, Jeff. Jeff's got a good one. There's a, there's one that I saw recently with um, uh, Mark Bell. I don't know if you guys love, I'm, I'm a bit of a meathead, right? I love Mark Bell. Um, really, really interesting story uh, if you're not familiar with Mark Bell. Uh, but anyway, Jeff had spoken there. There was an old man test that I saw on Mark Bell, which was about being able to stand on one foot, put your sock on, put your shoe on, do your shoelace up, get onto the other foot, do the same thing. I don't think I could do that personally. Um, well, I know I can't do that. I know I can't do that standing. Um, but that, that's uh, one of the things that Mark Bell, who's an elite level power lifter, I think he may even have two, may even had his hip replaced, and he's able to do it. So I've got a bit of catching up to do. He's about 45. Um, highly recommend their content. Um, getting them to change their mind. Yeah, look, it, there's a lot of stuff in there as well. Um, none of this is easy, right? If it was easy, you know, we wouldn't be in a job uh, as trainers. But now let's move into um, what is, well, how it can look in a program setting. So we've looked at, you know, what I would define sort of functional training as. We've looked at uh, some of the science behind functional training. Okay, and now we're going to look at how it might 
work within your within your business, okay? I'd put it down to these sort of things. I'd put it down to the primal movement patterns. I'm sure we're all familiar with this sort of stuff. We're familiar with the, the seven primal movement patterns, squat, lunge, bend, or hinge, twisting slash rotation or anti-rotation, uh, pull movements, push movements, and then we've got some gait movements, so whether walking, jogging, sprinting, okay? If your program is incorporating a lot of this stuff, I would call it functional. If your program is incorporating a balance of this stuff, you're looking at creating a, a good holistic program in my opinion as well. So seven movement patterns, uh, plus mixing up the planes of motion, whether it be frontal, sagittal, transverse. These are the things that in my mind make up a functional training program. Things that are not like, because we've got to go beyond because things aren't always symmetrical and things aren't always perfect. So that's where we're talking about some of these other odd objects, uh, which we're going to talk about later, because our life isn't predictable. You know, again, for me, I've got two little kids. They don't move in a predictable manner. Uh, there's some kicking and screaming and all that sort of stuff that you've got to you've got to deal with when you're picking them up, putting them out of the car, getting them out of the pram all of this fun stuff. So for me, that's the functional side of things. It's dealing with crazy moving loads, right? But one thing that you see quite often in a functional training realm is stuff like this. It's a lot of stuff that's working on really, um, on unstable surfaces, on moving surfaces, you know, and it's sort of passed off as, hey, this is, this is what functional training looks like. Functional training looks like standing on a Swiss ball and doing this activity. Look, in my opinion, that's not functional training, you know, like in my opinion, that's some kind of other different thing, you know, like not that there's no benefit in some of this stuff, but to me, it's not functional training. Like when was the last time any of us had to do an activity on an unstable surface? You know, like so often, I think that that's some of the things that's turned uh, a lot of people off the term functional training because so much of it revolved around, oh, well, it's just doing an exercise on an unstable surface you know like when when was the last time i mean some of you might work on maybe some of you are skateboarders and stuff like that and snowboarders and maybe you're working on unstable surfaces um maybe you live in a cold area you know i don't know yet ice uh we got anywhere jindabyne might get some ice some black ice i lived in canada for a little bit and you definitely have to deal with some slippery surfaces there but Functional training doesn't mean necessarily working out on an unstable surface and just making something unstable doesn't necessarily make it an unstable, like doesn't make it a functional exercise, all right? Yeah, so just following in the chat there. So, like I said, um, it doesn't mean working out on an unstable surface, but I think what it does mean is actually working with different loads, working on different planes of motion. Like I said, things like picking up the kids, like gardening, like moving the bins, all of that stuff. Uh, you know, apparently one of the leading injuries of like causes of knee injuries is getting on and off the gutter, stepping off a gutter. Um, apparently, it's a really leading cause of knee injuries. So all of that sort of stuff is is what functional training looks like, you know, so Peterson step ups, all that sort of cool stuff. So to me, many functional movements will likely fit into the categories of the seven um, movement patterns. I'm going to break that down a little bit with the graph below. And they're also likely to fit into several of the categories. And like I said, include things like working across different planes of motion. So if you look at something like a hinge, it might be things like deadlifts, kettlebell swings, kettlebell snatches, um, You've got um, some banded stuff that you can do with deadlifts. You've got good mornings. All of these sort of things can fit in that hinge realm. Squat, you name it. You've got um, you know, TRX, you've got single leg squats, you've got eccentric squats, you've got goblet squats. Uh, all of these sort of exercises um, fit in the squat realm. Again, lots of variations of those. Step up, step downs. The ability to control yourself going down a step is really important. So that's one thing that I've seen also, um, some studies around uh, longevity stuff where people can can control going down a step for three seconds. Um, big indicator of muscle and balance as well. Uh, lunges, walking lunges, lateral lunges, COSAC, COSAC squats or lunges, uh, rear lunges, all of this stuff works in multiple planes, okay? anti-rotation stuff or rotation stuff, wood chops, pallov presses, 
Bird Dog, uh, Renegade Rose, all excellent exercises. Okay, push. We've got push-ups, we've got chest presses, uh, we've got chest pass with a med ball, we've got shoulder presses, we've got overhead throws, all that sort of stuff. Fits in the push realm. Pull, could be with a rope, it could be with rows on a band, on a TRX, could be pull-ups or pull-downs on a band. Again, playing around with open and closed chain exercises as well. Gate could be things like farmer's carries, suitcase carries, crawls runs, all of that sort of stuff would fit within gait. And again, not just necessarily running straight, you know, it might be lateral shuffles and all of this sort of stuff. If you're running a program that's ticking this stuff off, you know, doesn't need to tick off all of it in in, in the one session, all right? You probably are gonna tick off most of it in one session when you add in a warm up and a cool down though. Um, but you know, your main focus may not, you know, your main focus of the workout's not gonna like have all of these unlikely. But you want to make sure in your program you are ticking off these elements to make sure you've got that well-rounded product okay so what are the best tools for the job then realistically almost anything can work okay almost anything works but what you want to look for is versatile equipment so like many of you said earlier i don't know many of you guys gym based and many of you like home studio outdoor trainers uh, let us know if you're like a gym or a home studio because it, it really looks different with where you're based, okay? But we come from a background of outdoor fitness, of boot camps and stuff like that as a, on a business sense. That's where we sort of um, found ourselves typically uh, as personal trainers, a lot of outdoor training, a lot of boot camp training. So for us, let me just have a look at the chat, outdoor education facilities, yep. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so a big mix. Yeah, F45. But for for us and for me personally, I would look for equipment that is versatile um, for the clientele, all right? Versatile, that it means you've got this range of exercises that you can do with that one bit of equipment, all right? And it's also suitable for multiple levels of clientele. So you don't need to have crazy big amounts of different things to, to change it. So with like a TRX, for example, you can easily make a movement easier or harder for anybody, okay? Um, portable was always important on my end. And so for me, the four things that tick these boxes, resistance bands, suspension trainers, kettlebells, and medicine balls. Now, does that mean you can't use barbells or dumbbells? No, of course not. I mean, most of my training revolves around barbells, right? Like, but again, horses for courses. It really depends on what your client's goals are, what's going to be functional for them, all right? So this is stuff that works in my opinion really uh, well for gen pop and it ticks those boxes of what most client goals are moving better um, getting stronger losing weight being more stable in in positions being able to chase their kids around all of this sort of stuff to me you can answer that you can tick a lot of those boxes with these four bits of equipment is there any other equipment there that some of you guys would go now you know what these are my absolute go-to uh, for their functional, you know, sandbags are in there as well. I love sandbags. Um, but let's have a look. Yep. Mini bands, yep. Yeah, a lot of other great bits of equipment. Okay. So let's break down. Uh, again, this is based on my, my personal opinion and why these bits of equipment fit the job. Okay. So resistance bands, why? Cheap and portable. Now, when I say resistance bands, I do include mini bands, like in the image above, uh, big band, like the big power loops, like the image uh, below, um, and with the handles, all range of them. Um, one of my favorite bits of equipment is actually a, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the rip trainer. I absolutely love that bit. It's like on a bungee cord with a, with a pole and it's on one side. Such a cool bit of equipment. Uh, if you've not used it before, it's a TRX branded thing. Um, yeah, absolutely love that. Um, now, resistance bands, suitable for most home programs, suitable for online PT, suitable for boot camp, right? Safe bit of equipment that you can use in a lot of different formats, okay? It's great for a lot of things. There's, and like I said, there's the variation there within the bands as well. So you can, you know, you can come up with lots of different things with mini bands, whether it be rows, deadlifts, uh, the standard glute stuff, as you see in the image above, um, and with the big power bands, lots of other cool variations as well. So for me, what are my favorite movements with the bands? My absolute favorite is the Palov press. Anyone here, everyone familiar with the Palov press? 
So the panel, yep, yeah, perfect. So panel of press, basically, uh, you're going to have, if I'm, if I'm looking this way, I'm going to have the anchor point over here, the band in front of me, and I'm going to be pressing the band out with it pulling one way. Absolutely. Yeah, it works with the cable machine as well uh, as bands. Yeah. Um, absolutely love the power of press. Um, next one's row variations. I think bands, row variations with the bands, whether it be overhead, uh, face pulls, you name it. Uh, lots of cool row variations with the bands. Um, and again, I'm a bit of a meathead. So I love the tricep pull down exercises uh, with the bands as well. Um, personally. So tips, the band must be taught all the time throughout the movement. So taught tight through the whole movement. So if you get to the, uh, you know, in the end of the movement, you still want to have that band tight. You don't want to have it completely loose. So it always should be tight. So even when they're doing exercises like this, you want to keep that band tight the whole time. So rather than bringing their legs all the way together, so the band gets all floppy and loose, you want to just bring it a little bit together and then step out again. All right. So you want to have that taut and tight throughout the whole thing. For me, the anti-rotation movement with the bands are the best, you know, so all of that stuff where it's like unilateral, one side of the pallet press, single hand row variations, all of those are absolutely excellent um, when it comes to using bands. My opinion also bands are best for higher rep stuff or longer sets. So whether it be, hey, we're going to be working for a minute with the band or we're going to be working on you know, 25 repetitions or whatever. I think bands work best in a higher rep um, setting for general population. Um, again, like I said, I follow Mark Bell and you know, Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell. So I use bands a lot for my powerlifting sort of stuff. One to three reps. Excellent for that. Typically speaking, gen pop, I think best for higher reps, longer sets. All right. Anyone got a favorite band exercise? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, uh, Paul's saying the, the downside of the bands is, is not knowing the, the actual level of resistance. I get that, and that, like the progressive overload sense, 100% that's a downside to, to using bands is, is you don't have that control of, of like a progressive overload. Um, but again, if we're, you know, again, it's, it's sort of horses for courses a little bit. Like I said, it depends on what your goals are for that client. Um, but yeah, you, you obviously, yep, yep. Yeah, I, 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 that's 100% an issue with bands. Um, but I think, I think the way that 99% of people are going to use bands, I don't think that matters too much, um, so to speak. Pull apart, yeah, clamshells, squat walk, single leg deadlift, love that. Yep, yep, yep. Palov press, yeah, love it, love it. Assisted muscle up, good one. Yep, overhead press. Yeah, so many good things. Yeah, so many good things, so many good things. Yeah, tons, 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 tons. Ooh, assisted Nordic, you're a you're a crazy man, David. But yes, I, I use bands for, for that as well. So let's move on from bands. Suspension trainers. So why are they one of the best tools for the job? Again, for me, scalable for all clientele. So it doesn't matter whether your clients are 15 years old, 25 years old, or 80 years old you can scale a, a suspension trainer to suit everybody. Suitable again for home programs, online PT stuff, boot camps and groups, All right? So versatile as well. They're cheap and portable. When I first got into the industry, uh, there's basically TRXs um, and they were like 300 bucks a pop. <laughs> and I think they're still pretty expensive. And there weren't really any, um, any of the, I suppose, uh, mock-up brands or copycat brands that are floating around nowadays uh, for the suspension trainers. Um, you know, now you can pick them up out of, you know, Coles or not Coles, but Kmart and Aldi, and you can pick them up for under 50 bucks uh, and also online easily. So they're, they're cheap and portable now. So there's a really easy thing to have. For me personally, favorite movements, the hamstring curl, um, absolute go-to killer uh, on this uh, inverted rows, Again, all row variations. It doesn't need to be completely inverted, but a row variation. Again, tips, understand the pendulum effect of the, of the, of the straps. So knowing that um, you know, when you stand up taller, it's gonna be easier. When you get right underneath and have more body weight, it's gonna be harder. If you're doing something like a hamstring curl, if this is the anchor point here and, and my body's here, if I have my legs on this side of the anchor point, it's gonna be a little bit easier because the strap wants to come in. If I have my legs on this side of the anchor point to do my hamstring curls, it's going to be harder because the strap is 
is pulling me back this way. So I've got a bit of added resistance. So understanding that pendulum effect uh, makes a difference. Um, control, slow, steady. It's not about necessary. There's very few movements, I think, with the suspension strap um, that are like uh, explosive movements. I think it's more controlled, more steady. All right. And great for posterior chain. Again, in the chats, I'd love to hear what your, uh, what your favorite exercise is using a suspension strap. Let's see what we've got. Metronome row, pendulum TRX or yeah, nice. Single leg runner, I love that one as well. Yeah, rows, flies, yep, yep, yep. Handstand push-ups. Um, that one disappeared, sorry. Yep, handstand push-ups do work. Wire raise, yeah, Jack Knight. Oh, Jack Knight's a great one. Love that one as well, mountain climbers. Yeah, sled, Claire. That's actually my favorite way as well. Um, I probably should have put it in there. I love it for sleds. Absolutely love it for sleds. Rollouts, yeah, awesome. So, yeah, uh, best tool for the job. The next one is kettlebells, but we'll go back to my man JP Sears for a moment um, to hear what he thinks about kettlebells. I'm all about kettlebells. Kettlebell training makes you better at everything in life but mostly they only make you better at kettlebell training. Because kettlebells help you build less muscle than traditional bodybuilding exercises, they give you a better workout. With this exercise, I use 90% less weight than with regular back squats, but my legs get a better workout because I'm holding the kettlebell in front of me, which gives me more shoulder activation. One of the biggest benefits of kettlebells is improved calluses. My grandfather always said, you can judge a man based on the size of his calluses. My calluses are also a pretty big turn on for my girlfriend. She acts like they're not, but they are. <laughs> I'm all about calluses. All right, so well, how do I get out of this one? You know what's going on? All right. Again, I love kettlebells, but I just think that's a great take on, on kettlebells. I, I love a bit of satire, humor, humor. And like I said, I think that's, that's all part of the one video. It's absolutely an excellent video on functional training and i think he nailed it um i think the industry has evolved from the time he did that video i think the functional training has, has come to a more mainstream like what we're talking about today um but yeah absolutely uh so it's yeah one of my favorite things with uh jpc is that particular video so kettlebells despite that video i absolutely love them uh why i think they're one of the best tools for the job unilateral exercises I, can't, I don't think there's any other bit of equipment that works as well for unilateral stuff as kettlebells. Um, yeah, hands down, the best thing, I think, personally, for unilateral stuff. Absolutely excellent for carries um, and also great for a combination of cardio and resistance. You do it using kettlebells, you're using them for things like swings or cleans or snatches or Turkish get-ups. You're getting a great combination of cardio as well as strength training, all right? For me, favorite movements, um, swing, clean. For me personally, snatches as well, general pop, probably not. I'd probably stick with just the swings. Um, but if you get more more advanced in this stuff, you can definitely teach things like cleans and snatches. Turkish get-ups drives right into that sit to rise test. Um, absolutely great one. Carries, drives into the grip strength, drives into the gait, drives into all of that sort of stuff. Uh, absolutely love, um, love those variations of movements. Tips when it comes to um, using kettlebells. Look, something like the swings, I, like I, I can't talk about doing courses enough. Um, you know, we do have an, ed that's what we do. We run courses in education. But the amount of times that I see the swings done incorrectly um, by, by everybody, whether it be by clients, by trainers, um, looks easy, but it's, it's quite often done really poorly. Um, and it can be very easily, and they're very quick fixes, uh, most of the errors, okay? Um, Education, you know, understanding that education uh, as a trainer is really important so that you know how to efficiently teach these movements to clientele as well. So I always talk about the difference between doing a movement and the difference between coaching to do the movement. So, you know, I, I, I'm i lucky. I, I quite often can see, so unless there's mobility issues, you know, like, you know, I'm pretty rubbish with my overhead squat and stuff like that because of mobility. Um but I'm quite lucky that I can see a movement and I can replicate that pretty well. But just because I can do that doesn't mean I can then coach the intricacies of that movement to another person. All right. So it's really important to understand that just because you can do it well, 
doesn't necessarily mean you've got the the communication skills to coach it as well. So that's what we really focus on with a kettlebell course as well. Um, knowing the cues, knowing the teaching techniques, right? So really important there. Medicine balls, another great one. Why do I think medicine balls are really good? I love them for max power. Um, oh, going back, kettlebells, I didn't ask. Any favorite movements for kettlebells? Yeah, Lauren's talking about the difference of the, of the American and Russian swing there. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, horses, courses. I, I would. I, the only reason the CrossFit use that swing is it's like a standard of mo- uh, standard motion. So uh, if they're doing you know swings in a wad, they got to they got to be able to count like was that a rep or was that not a rep. So for them, was it a rep? Is up over here. I can't do it. Like I I can't hold my hands. Not a good thing. Not not a bragging thing. It's a bad thing. I couldn't hold a kettlebell up overhead like this in a safe way for my shoulders after reps and coming down. If I'm going to do that, I'm going to do snatches. Uh, personally, just snatches is way better, personally. Um, yeah, yeah, cleans. I love cleans. Single swings, kettlebell swings, snatch press. Yeah, perfect. Lots of good stuff. RDLs, yeah, doesn't get much better. Upright, uh, yeah. A doorstop. <laughs> I have seen plenty of kettlebells. I used to live in a unit building, and I, I may or may not have pinched someone's kettlebells when they sat as a doorstop for about six months and hadn't been touched. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to acquire those kettlebells. Sorry, missed in person in the unit who was using it as a doorstop. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, lots of good stuff. Yeah, perfect. Lots of lots of good exercises. All right, let's get into med balls. We haven't got too much longer. Med balls, why are they a good tool for the job? For me, max power. Max, max power. None of these sort of tools... Uh, you could do it with bands, I suppose, like I said, in the, in the sort of um, velocity style stuff. Max power, med, uh, med balls, dead balls, slam balls, best thing you can do. Um, uh, and you can do some partner stuff with it. But uh, Oh, and throws. I would have throws in there as well. Um, favorite movement, throws and slams, partner exercises, um, and some tips. You don't need a really heavy med ball, slam ball, dead ball. You don't need a really heavy one, all right? Realistically, again, for most gen pop, I find sort of between that three to eight kilo works really well for slams. If you're slamming it, you need to really be able to control your body and your movement. And um, max effort means max effort. You know, the amount of times that I see a slam looking like this, and that's a slam. Now, a slam is up, hinge, boom, and you're trying to make that, make that dead ball explode on the floor. I used to tell people it was full of diamonds. You know, like I'd say that ball is full of diamonds. If you can smash it open, you get to keep them all. You know, it's just like trying to get that visual in the clients. Like max effort is max effort. And there's a reason we do max effort, you know? Um, and that's why I love medicine balls for those max effort. Same thing for throws, overhead throws. You can do it with other bits of equipment, um, you know, but it's a lot harder. It's so like, medicine balls are such a safe and effective way to put in just like max effort to throw the ball as far as you can with a chest pass over the back of your head or slam it on the ground it's a safe way of just pushing like those max effort um max effort essentially so uh love to hear med balls why med balls slam balls dead balls why you love to use them um i also love i mean i have a set of of bought like my my med balls go up to 75 kilos so i also love like big heavy like you know, Atlas Stone stuff as well, but not necessarily for Gen Pop, you know. Um, I love those ones. I love the big heavy ones. You know, carrying them, all that sort of stuff is fun. Um, yeah, versatile, yeah. The yeah, same sort of thing. As I said, for me personally, Turkish Gap is great with a ball because uh, it helps people uh, keep that real locked alignment, um, variety power, yeah. Same sort of thing, yeah. I love... Uh, Again, as you can see, each of these tools, the reason that I think it ties well is that it ticks off all those boxes. So when we go back to that list of what is functional training, to me, each of these tools tick off a lot of those boxes. You know, it's free weights. It's um, it's working on core activation, unilateral. It's working on, works well with groups. It works well with technique. You know, that's why I love all of these bits of equipment. Um, I think they work very well uh for yeah they're safe they work very well for a lot of clientele uh for a lot of purpose okay perfect yeah lots of options lots of options 
All right, so we're about to sign off. If you have questions, uh, we've got a few minutes left before we sign off. But uh, before we go, we do have, as I said, we do offer lots of different courses uh, as well. So we do have um, a particular package here for you guys. So we do have a kettlebell course, uh, teaches all the swings, all the advanced swing variations, plus things like rows and cleans and press variations. There's some live coaching stuff in there. There's some workout stuff in there. It's 10 cc's, 297. Uh, this particular package, suspension training, all the upper body, lower body, supine, sled variations, regressions, progressions, workouts. Uh, 497 as a package um, is the special deal. So that'll be 20 cc's. I'll throw the link in a chat in a moment. Um, but what we do for today, for today's webinar, um, anyone who signs off off that link is also going to get their free resistance band course, which is also 10 cc's, 297. Plus, uh, that covers power bands, mini bands, workouts, drills, all that sort of good stuff, um, as well as uh, how to create your own branded stuff, how to go about getting like your, your bands branded as well. So that's in there. So you're looking at about $900 of value. Uh, again, you'll get these notes and you'll have these links, this link in the notes, but I'll put it in the chat. Again, $497 for those three courses. Plus then also, uh, if you're going to be, I don't know how many people are in here, it's about 232 at the moment. Um, if you're one of the first five people to sign up to this particular package, you'll also get the med ball in there as well. So you get 40 cc's, uh, you know, that covers traditional strength, ballistics, partner activities, workouts, 41 cc's, close to 1200 bucks in value, $497. Um, yeah, so like I said, this is what we do. Some of you may have done some of our courses in the past. If you have, um, hopefully you can say it in the chat that you enjoyed them and learned a bunch. If you haven't, um, you know, I've written all of these courses. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what we've got to offer for today. Q&A, throw it in the Q&A. A couple of things are in there uh, now. So I'd love to hear your thoughts, your feedback. Uh, we can do it in the Q&A and the chat. Um, I'll get that link in a second. Let me just get that link now. Whoop, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, okay, it's not what I wanted to do. Where are we going? We're going to the chat. So let me throw that link in the chat. So you should be able to get that link in the chat. Um, there are the references. Like I said, you, you should be able to get these notes uh, as well from Fitness Australia. There's that link. So again, in the chat a couple of times. So also make sure if you haven't uh, joined it yet, jump in, join the Fitness Education Online community group. If you enjoyed a bunch of the stuff we spoke about, the science stuff as well, um, like I said, I do a series called Bro Science with my brother, who is a sports medicine GP. He's in the army. Um, and we break down a lot of those science plus some other stuff. We've done some cool stuff recently around goal setting and um, uh, returning to exercise after COVID and a whole heap of stuff like that as well. Um, I'll throw it in here a couple of times. Uh, but... Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we've got, I've got time afterwards, so I would love to hear um, questions, feedback. I'm glad you all enjoyed the presentation today. Uh, a couple of things in the Q and A. Um, beautiful. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Um, all right. So, whoa. Uh, uh, I uh, Asan. I. Uh, outside of my scope um talking about like hysterectomy it's not even something i could tell you i've had any experience with um yeah i'd work with your clients physio uh or yeah physio or specialist yeah sorry i can't help you on that one yeah um they're at the start of their journey um yeah again i would just work with their physio work with their specialist um yeah, where's the fitness education online community? Uh, it's on Facebook, Fiona. I'll grab the link for you. Um, can I start the replay? Yes, courses, uh, Terence, Terence, Terence. Courses all self-paced. Um, you can work through them at your own time. No issues. Uh, those links, I'll grab those links and put them in the chat for you now. Won't be a moment. Um, so... And I'm always available if you want to send me a message and that sort of stuff as well. So please don't hesitate to send messages uh, to me. Uh, this is, oh, maybe I was sending those ones not to everybody. So hang on, there's that. Let me just get some of these links over. 
I think I was sending it only to the panelists. Sorry. I'll throw those links in the chat again. Um, won't be a second. Won't be a second, guys. Link there. Won't be a moment. So, and I'll get you the link for the Fitness Education Online podcast. So, yeah, it's within the Fitness Education Online podcast. Um, so, if you have a look in that within that podcast, there's a there's a series. We've done about twenty episodes with my brother called Bro Science. Uh, let me just get a link. Won't be a second, guys. I apologize for this. I'll get all those links. There are those links. So we've got the links there with um, the Facebook group the course special as well as the podcast there as well uh so let me just have a look let me go it's courses are self-paced uh, i missed the rest of those things so i think luke maybe has answered those uh but those other links are in the chat yet yeah, courses are all self-paced uh you have no time frame to complete them either um so yeah you can go through it at at your own expense yeah sorry david i was putting them privately um those links i think so hopefully this will go there all right any other questions i'm just looking at the chat trying to have a look through the chat Rent session perfect thanks uh thanks jeff thank you very much janet um yeah perfect glad you enjoyed the presentation yeah penny yep yeah, penny i reckon might recognize your name yep yeah. Yeah, uh, the person, yeah, Mish, who's that? Kirsten, Kristen, is it Kristen Campbell? Uh, yeah, Mish might be a very good person for the hysterectomy question. Uh, Michelle Wright. Um, yeah, that's probably a good, uh, what's the name of the podcast? Yeah, so the name of the podcast is Fitness Education Online Podcast, but within that there's episodes that we do called Bro Science. Um, that is all there. Perfect. Uh, oh, hey, Mercina. Yep, thank you very much. Perfect. Anyone going to Filex, by the way? We will be at, we're, we're going to be at Filex as well. So please come and say hello uh, if you run into us there as well. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Excellent. All right. Any any other questions, guys? What have we got? Uh, evaluation video or quiz based? Uh, these ones are all accommodation, Sophia. So Sophia, there you, they will have a short video um, component because they are practical courses. So yes, they will all have a short video. Each one is less than each one's about ten minutes or less. Um, and then there's also a quiz based at the end. Um, it's important. The video element on these ones is is really important. Yeah. Because obviously, you know, we want to make sure you, you, everyone's doing it right. Ah, oh, thanks, Greg. Um, glad you, glad to see you, um, see you here. All right, perfect. All right, I think we're, we're run out of questions. Uh, references for the course, uh, for what I spoke about today, they'll be in the notes. Um, so that's uh, I can share my I can share my screen again. So if you get the notes, I think Luke, you send out the the notes. I think afterwards, uh, references are in there as well. Yeah, so we'll send an email out. Um, probably won't be today, but probably be next early next week. So everyone will get an email early next week. Yeah, we'll yeah. put some of, some of those links in there as well from um the podcast and and the uh, other groups as well yeah and uh as i said this is the question i get most how do i receive the one cc for the webinar uh sounds like you just get it after your registration and you do your form maybe your feedback form yeah um, so, yeah. yeah there'll be a survey that pops up for you allison once um the session's over today and then just complete that session and the cc will get added next week perfect uh, if you don't see it added just get in touch and we'll, we'll sort that out for you yeah, and also there are the links, Facebook group, uh, the course, the special, as well as a link to Spotify um, for the podcast, if you are interested. All right. Perfect. No worries. Um, 
yeah, I think I think that's it for now. Um, hopefully, see a, a few at Phylex. Um, I'll be there with Oz Active as well. So um, keep an eye out for our stand. Um, we do have another webinar early next week. Um, so keep an eye on your emails for that. But um, anything else, Travis, from you? From your end? No, thank you very much, everyone. I'm really glad you you enjoyed it today. Hopefully, you took a lot out of it. Um, it's funny, funny putting a t presentation together on functional training. I found quite tricky uh, because I think it's such a broad term, and so I tried to I tried to do it justice with with what I, where I see it fits. So and based on the comments and stuff like that as we we're going through, I think uh, I think I, I suppose we've all got a pretty similar thought on where functional training fits in the fitness world and and, and how it can look like in, in our own businesses. So yeah, glad to know that I'm also on the same page as as everyone in here. So that's that's also good to know. Yeah, fantastic, Travis. Thanks for that, mate. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, and we'll hopefully see if you'll get Phylex, um in person next week. Thanks, thank you very guys. much, guys. See you.